Hi, Pastor Rob here. Just wanted to say thank you for all of your love and support here at the Bridge Church. I know many of you are visiting our website right now to maybe catch up on some sermons over the past weeks, or uh, maybe some of you are checking us out for the very first time, and we would just want to do everything we can to help you connect with God. Here at the Bridge Church, we believe it's our job to do exactly that. Connect people to God, and the best way we can do that is by connecting with you. So uh, we just wanted to let you know before you watch this message today, uh, our hope is that you would find your own faith community where wherever you're at, whether that be here in our corner of Northeast Iowa, maybe you can connect with us, uh, or, or wherever else you may be. Uh, connecting to a community is vitally important to your spiritual growth. So as happy as we are that you're using our online resources, our prayer and our hope is that you're able to find a faith community of your own, that you might be able to learn and grow and, and build yourself up spiritually and have others do that for you as well. So if, you, uh, if, if you're watching this for the very first time, uh, we pray that you're encouraged. We pray that, we pray that you're built up in, in your faith. And, uh, and we pray that you do exactly as the Apostle Paul has called you to do in the book of Hebrews, and that is to not give up meaning together. Thank you so much, and God bless. Well, I've got some good news and some bad news this morning. The good, the bad news, let's start with the bad news. The bad news is uh, summer is already half over. Yeah, boo, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Uh, the good news is football season's right around the corner. So I know y'all are rooting for the Packers. Let's go, baby. Come on now. Hey, uh, so glad to have you guys here today. I want, I want to start by talking about uh, this morning as we, uh, we're in week two of this series called You Asked For It. I want, to, I want to start by talking about plans, all right? We've all got plans, don't we, right? We've all got plans in life, uh, uh, whether they're set, they're set in stone or maybe we've written them down or at least at the very least scribbled them in the back of our heads. We've all got plans. Um, some might say, I, you know, someday I'm, I want to be a millionaire. I just want to be so rich that I got money coming out my ears. I want to have my own helipad in my backyard. You know, that's my goal. Those are my plans. And, and, and that's what I'm shooting for. Some of us may have different plans. Some of us may not be so ambitious. Some of us might say, you know what? I, I just want a nice house, a nice family, and just enough money to pay my bills. I, I don't know what your plans are, but, but something that I've come to realize as I've gotten older is that about 99.9% .9 of us, our plans don't always go as planned, do they? They don't always go as planned. When Stephanie and I were uh, uh, about to graduate college, we were, getting, we were finishing up our, our, our degrees uh, in Bible college, uh, we had plans, all right? We had plans. We knew what we were doing. We knew where we were going at that point in time. Uh, we had control of our lives and our destiny for the most part. Uh, we just knew what we wanted to do. Uh, and, and I'll just give you a, a, a small, simple uh, uh, layout of what our plans were after college. Hopefully you can read this on the screen. Rob and Stephanie's perfect plan is what it says. And... Uh, uh, our, after graduating college, our, uh, we had to complete an internship in order to, gra to, to get our degrees. And so we had to do a six-month internship. Now, my wife, she was a global missions major, which meant that our internship had to be where? Overseas, right? And so uh, our first plan after getting out of college was to go to Cambodia on internship for six months. Uh, but then after that, we knew we were going to have a ton of debt because that's what college students get is knowledge and debt. And you put them together and... Sometimes they don't equal out to good things. But anyways, uh, we, we, we were ready to graduate college, and we, said, and we had a bunch of friends that were going overseas, and they were teaching English overseas and making a ton of money doing it. So our plan number two, for no, number two, the, the, the second part of our plan was to go to Korea and teach English that we might be able to pay off debt, right? And we, not only that, we were, gonna, we were gonna travel the world, and we just, we, we were really, really excited about that. But then, but then after that, we're like, all right, once we get all our debt paid off, once we get everything figured out, we're going go to uh, we're, we're gonna go home, we're going to pastor a church of some kind, and then we're going to make babies. All right? That's what we're going to do. This was our plan. We had it set in stone. We were so excited about it until February of 2010 came around. February of 2010. I remember the day our surprise, of our surprise. Uh, Stephanie took the test while I was standing in the kitchen doing dishes. Um, I remember thinking as I stood there washing dishes, the test is going to be negative. It's, it's been negative every other time. She's just overreacting, just like always, until I heard a cry come from the bathroom behind me. 
The day after finding out uh, Stephanie was pregnant, uh, I wrote a blog, and this last week I actually stumbled upon it. And and when I was in, um, I was on social media, and I was looking up some. I was trying to look up a quote uh, on Facebook, and I actually came across this blog that I wrote the day after we found out. Because, and and I thought it would be pertinent to share it with you all because I I didn't know what to do when we found out Stephanie was pregnant. like, what do you do with your first child? It, it was a surprise to both of us. Um, we didn't feel ready. We weren't prepared. I mean, no, no parents do feel prepared, right? But our plans, well, those were out the window, and we were absolutely terrified. So let me just read a little bit of the blog that I wrote the day after we found out Stephanie was pregnant. I said, that this is what I wrote. I said, I won't be able to post this blog for a while, but I need to get all these thoughts out of my head and my heart. Stephanie is pregnant. I don't know what to do, but simply pause. What's going to happen? What, what, what are we going to do now? More importantly, God, what are your plans for us? I, I can't help by, but be weighed down by such a burden of responsibility. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to be a dad. I don't know how we're going to pay for this child, for this wonderful, beautiful gift that's bestowed upon our lives. What, what are we supposed to, where are we supposed to go from here? All of our plans are shot. Dad told me to enjoy the next seven or eight months because it will never be so peaceful in my household again. (laughs) It's so funny throughout these past few months, I've actually thought about what it would be like to be a dad as some of our friends have been having kids at that time. And and how I'm not sure what it's truly like to love a child like a father. My heart feels so burdened with so much responsibility and a deep, deep desire to be a good dad. Well, Stephanie had her panic attack and now I'm trying not to have one on my own. My chest has been pounding since we found out yesterday and has not stopped. Um, I'm scared. I'm humbled. I'm feeling heavy burdened. I'm nervous. But then, I'm also excited. I pray I can be a good father. I pray that I love this child half as much as my father in heaven loves me. I pray that I can set a good example and not put a face on for my kids. I pray that God would humble me each and every day through this child, this blessing, this gift of which I truly do not, nor ever will, deserve. Today we're in week two of this series called You Asked For It. Um, In the month of June, we asked all of you, hey, if you could ask God any question, if you had any question about faith or life, what would it be? And many of you submitted questions. And and last week, Joe spent a lot of time talking about heaven and hell. And and, and, or a couple weeks ago, excuse me, he spent a lot of time talking about heaven and hell and the afterlife. A lot of you had a lot of questions pertaining to that. But today, I get the opportunity to talk about parenting. Now, before we get started um, this morning, uh, I need you to know this. No matter how much I preach on this this morning, I could preach until two o'clock, okay? I'm only preaching till one, just relax. Uh, No, but no matter how much I preach on this, we're going to feel shortchanged a little bit because I could preach a whole series on parenting. As a matter of fact, I have in the past. And and the second thing I need you to know is that I I don't got it all figured out, okay? My my son is, my oldest is just eight years old, the one that I just wrote the blog about, I read the blog about. Um, He's just eight years old, and and I've been told you're not a real parent until you have a teenager. Is that true? Can I get an Amen. Okay, so, uh, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna share with you kind of some wisdom that I've gotten from God's word and, and from others that, that have uh, come around me and helped me uh, learn what it's like to be a good father and a dad. But in week one, Joe talked about heaven, hell, and the afterlife. But this week, our, we're just gonna address one question because I thought as I was going through all the questions that you all submitted, when I came across this one, I was like, man, I feel like a lot of our families are dealing with this thing and, and I just wanna, wanna tackle that this morning. So here's the question we're gonna be looking at, okay? How do we guide our children towards God without pushing them away? How do we dr- guide our children towards God without pushing them away? One of you submitted this question, and it just really stuck out to me. And, and, and I don't know about you, but I think that's a pretty solid question. I think that's a, a really solid question, as a matter of fact. How do we guide our children toward, toward God without pushing them away? I think that's a great question, specifically because it gets right at the core of what raising a child is all about. Because specifically, if you're a believer, you're not just raising a child, are you? You're not just raising a child. As a matter of fact, you're making a disciple. You're making a disciple. I mean, seriously, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that should be your number one goal as a parent. Not to get your kid to do everything you want, to do, want them to do or to be everything you want them to be, but to help them submit to Jesus as the author and master of their lives in light of his 
love. My number one job as a father, your number one job as a parent is to get them to fall in love with Jesus, amen? That's what we're, what we're called to do as parents. And I don't think there's a simple answer to how we do that. How, how do you do that? How do you guide your children to know God without shoving the gospel down their throats, without pushing them away, without leaving, getting them to leave the church with a bad taste in their mouths? Many of you this morning would say, you know what, when I was younger, I left the church because I had a bad taste in my mouth. And that may be the motivation to this question. The parent that, that submitted this question might, might have left the church with a bad taste in their mouth, and they're saying, you know what, I don't want my kids to end up like that. And, and I don't think this is a simple answer this morning to this question. And I don't think it's, it's something that just happens if we just make church services on Sunday and Wednesdays a priority. It takes a lot more than that. Throughout Scripture, and this is out of order in your bulletins if you're taking notes, but throughout Scripture, we find that children bring two things into our lives. We find that children bring th th two things into our lives, blessing and responsibility. Blessing and responsibility. Children, as difficult and taxing as they can be, are a blessing. Amen? Amen. Psalm 127 describes children as arrows in the hands of a warrior. Blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. We must always keep sight of that, but then they're also our responsibility. Today's, guiding, uh, today's question of guiding our children is actually rooted in this next command we're about to look at. It's found in the book of Deuteronomy, um, where Moses commands the Israelites to take all that God has commanded them and to impress it upon their children's hearts. Check this out. This is what it says. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Whose hearts? Your hearts. Our hearts, right? He's talking to the parents. These are supposed to be on your hearts first. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But then in verse 7, he says, impress them upon your children. Talk about them when you sit at home, over the, in our context, at the dinner table. Talk about them when you sit at home, when you walk along the road, or when you're, sitting, you're riding in the car, when you lie down as your, as your kids go to bed, and when you get up in the morning. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. In Jewish culture and practice, there were literally rabbis that would tie boxes with scripture verses onto their heads. That's a true story. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. That's a tremendous responsibility that God gives us. We are to impress God's word and ways on our children's heart. But here's the thing. That's not simple is it? It's not simple. For those of us who have been parents for a while now, we know this firsthand. Don't get me wrong. Um, I'm no expert. I've only been a father for a little over eight years but now, but I know that this isn't an easy task. I know it's going to take a lot of intentionality on Stephanie and I's part because we don't just want to shove the gospel down their throats, but at the same time, we don't want them to miss it, do we? We don't want them to miss it. The word impress here in this passage comes from the Hebrew word shenan. Everybody say that with me. Shenan. All right, now you're, you can go ahead and share that with somebody and they can think you're really smart next time you talk about this passage, all right? Shenan, it's a Hebrew word. It means to uh, sharpen or wet a blade. It means to point or direct someone in a specific direction. It means to teach diligently. I think the first definition is probably my favorite one. To sharpen or wet a blade. I mean... That's, that's what we're doing when we impress God's word and ways on our children's hearts, right? We're sharpening them. We're preparing them for battle. We're preparing them and, 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 and praying that, to, that we might help them gain the wisdom of God to take on the battles that life's going to throw at them. Because, man, life's going to throw us battles. Amen? I mean, it's throwing us battles daily. But then when you go back to the English language and you look up the definition of the word impress, you come across this idea of making a mark. You come across this idea of making a mark. Let me tell you something. If I want anyone or anything to make a mark on my child, I want it to be Jesus, don't you? I mean, come on, have you really thought about that? Don't give me the Christian answer. I mean, obviously we're in church. Obviously I want Jesus to make a mark on my child, but what are you doing that he might be able to do that? What are you doing to facilitate the softening of your child's heart that they might make Jesus not only a part of their lives, but the focus of their lives, a priority in their lives? 
I don't care if you believe in God or not. Even if you're here today and you'd say, I'm not sure if I believe in this Jesus guy, I think you'd still want him to have a positive mark on your child's life to impact their lives in such a way that shapes who they are. Because even if you don't believe in Jesus, I think you would say the character he was painted as in Scripture was a phenomenal example of what you would like to see in your child's life someday. So what do I do as a parent? What do I do as a parent? How do I impress God's word on my child's heart without shoving the gospel down their throats or worse yet, pushing them away. Well, quite honestly, I, th I think it comes down to three simple keys. Okay, I really do. I think it comes down to three simple keys that we need to pay attention to as parents. And, and paying attention to these three keys is much easier said than done. It's going to take hard work. It's going to take intentionality. It's going to take you, uh, hey, I know it's time to put the kids to bed, but we need to, we need to have some family devotions together. I know we're exhausted. I know we're tired. I don't know. I know you don't want to roll out of bed and make time for this. I know that there are things that you need to be that I need to be doing. But but I, we have to be intentional and we have to realize the importance of doing these things. It takes hard work and intentionality and time on your part. It takes uh, character. It takes integrity and hum humility because a lot of the things that we're going to talk about this morning are going to mean that you're going to have to make life change. It means you're going to have to change your routine. You're going to have to change the way you do things. It's going to, it means you're going to have to change the way you, you live your life in a lot of ways. The way you act out your faith. That your kids might benefit and become better than you were. And I'm just going to give you the three, the three keys right away, okay? We have to pay attention to what we model, teach, and allow. I'm not going to put them all on the screen right now, but we have to pay attention to what we model, teach, and and allow. I really think a lot of parenting comes down to those three things, and I think that Scripture affirms that. It all starts with what we model, okay? It all starts with what we model, and I don't think we can put enough weight on this concept. What you model to your children is what they will pay attention to and replicate more than anything. More than anything. We can't just teach. We have to model what we Preach. I can tell you this. I know a number, a number, a number. I can't count on two hands the number of people that I know that are adults now that can memorize, that, that have scripture memorized in their hearts. They, they know all the knowledge. They were taught all the Bible stories, but their parents never actually lived out their faith and modeled what it meant to be a Christ follower, nor did they uh, encourage their child to step into that other than, hey, I want you to know all these Bible stories. I want you to have all this knowledge. And what ended up happening was the, the, the child ended up leaving the church afterwards because there was nothing to go after other than they were just treated like a receptacle for information afterwards throughout the, the years that they did attend church. It all starts with what we model. We can't just teach. We have to model what we preach. Paul models this in uh, how he writes to families. Check this out. In his letter to Titus, he writes this. He says, teach the older men to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to too much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to subject be subject to their husbands, so that no one will malign the word of God. So that no one will malign the word of God. He starts with the parents. He starts with the adults. He starts with the older crowd. He goes, not only does call Paul, Paul call the men and the women to set an example, but he's very specific about who he speaks to first. The adults. In everything, set, the, the, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose them may not be ashamed because of because they have nothing bad to say about us. He starts with the adults before he talks to the children. He says, listen, you have to be an example first. Otherwise, everything you teach is not going to matter. 
It's not going to matter because he knows that if they can't model what's true and righteous, then what they teach will all be for naught. And this isn't the only time we see this in Scripture. In Colossians 3, 18 through 21, Paul speaks to the husbands and wives before, uh, before direction to the children and to have them honor their parents. In 1 Peter, Peter calls the elder leaders to set the example before addressing the younger crowd. All throughout Scripture, we see God and the apostles directing us to pay attention to who we are and what we are modeling before he ever addresses the children and the youth. So my question this morning is, not only have you fallen in love with Jesus yourself, but are you living like he's the focus of your life? Are you setting the example by saying, son, not only do we make the church a priority, we make the poor a priority, we make the hurt and the broken a priority in the way that we live our life, the way that we do our life, the way that we uh, uh, manage our finances, the things that we give to, the, way, the, the ways we invest our time. Our whole lives are modeled around that which Jesus Christ called us to. What are you modeling to your children? Let me get really specific. How much do you have to drink on a Friday night? How do you treat your wife? How do you talk about your husband? What's your work ethic like? What are your Bible reading habits like? Do you make God a priority in everything? Or are you praying with and for your children more than just at mealtimes? What are you modeling? Are you engaged in a relationship with Jesus yourself? Or are you just making sure they get to church and youth group every week? Let me tell you, those are good things, but that's not enough. I tell you what, during the fall and the, spring, and, and the winter and the spring, I see cars flooding into our parking lot on Wednesday nights. I see just car after car after car flooding into our parking lots every night, and, and every Wednesday night. And you know what I think every time I see those cars? None of, them, none of that's going to matter unless the parents are modeling at home. You can make sure your kid gets to VBS. You can make sure he gets to Kids Club. You can make sure she's, she's at church every single Sunday. You can make sure that, 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 that you're doing all of the right things to get them into the church, but if you're not living it at home, if you're not modeling who Jesus called you to be at home, it means nothing. It's funny, I, I, social media, I actually find a lot of sermon illustrations and quotes. Um, and the other day, a couple weeks ago, uh, I saved this as soon as I saw it. It was this picture, and you can't, maybe you can't see what it is, but it's a statue of a father and a son. And, it, and it, if you look really closely, you notice there's holes in the statue of the father, right? But the cool thing is, is that the statue of the son is made out of those holes from the father, if you look closely, you'll notice that the statue of the Son was made with pieces removed from the statue of the Father. This represents how our children take and reincarnate so much of who we are as they grow older. And I would bet that most of what they take is simply modeled to them. It's simply modeled to them. What are you modeling to your child? Specifically, men, you are the spiritual head of the home. I do this every time we talk about parenting. Men, let me call you out. What are you modeling? Your children take more cues from you than you realize. What are you modeling to your child each and every day? So we have to pay attention to who we are first but, and what we're modeling, but then we also have to be intentional about what we're teaching, right? What we model, teach, and allow. 
Now, let me just reiterate this. If you're not modeling God's word and ways to your children, then it's going to be hard to teach them. But teaching is important. They're not just going to learn everything by osmosis, okay? They're not just going to learn everything by osmosis. Uh, Proverbs 22.6 says this, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from, from it. I don't know about you, but I'm always looking for those moments in my children's lives when I can teach them life lessons, okay? I'm just always looking for those things, those little nuggets that I can find or, or ways that I can teach them something that they'll be able to carry along with them uh, uh, when they're older. And I remember uh, over the last year here, I was actually uh, teaching my oldest daughter how to ride her bike without training wheels, all right? How many of you have ever done this? Raise your hand. Okay, come on now. All right, so uh, you can all relate to me when I say that it is one of the most frustrating but rewarding things that you get to do as a parent. Uh, uh, would you agree with, with that? It's one of the most frustrating but rewarding things you get to do as a parent. I remember when I was... Uh, uh, teaching my daughter to, to, to ride, she just kept falling down, just like every other kid does, you know, as she was learning. And each time she fell down, it would only discourage her, right? Because she doesn't want to get hurt. It's no fun with falling down. Nobody likes falling off their bike, and, and she'd get even more scared. And, and, and a number of our children have done this as we've taught them to ride their bikes. They just want to quit, right? How many of you have been there? you got to convince your child to keep trying. It's horrible, right? Um, but that day, I was able to teach my daughter a huge life lesson that I'll never forget this day. I, it was so special to me. Um, I looked her in the eyes when she, was, when she was crying, and she was upset, and she had her arms crossed. You know, I'm not doing this again, and she's so, so upset. And I said, babe, I love you, and I know it hurts, but do you know why we fail? Do you, do you know why we falter? So we can learn. I told her, I looked her in the eyes, I said, you won't learn very much in this world if you're not willing to fail and falter. You're not going to learn much if every time you fall you just decide to quit. But what matters? What makes a difference? The difference between people that are successful in this world and people that aren't are the ones that get back up. I said, babe, I know you're falling. I know it hurts. I know it's difficult. But if you get back up, I promise you, you're going to be glad you did. And that was a really, just a tremendously special moment. Because it, then it clicked. And then every time she fell, she didn't even hesitate. She just grabbed her bike and threw it back up and started riding again. And, and she, was, she was smiling and she was excited. And within, I'm not kidding you, within five minutes, because she was no longer afraid to fail... She was riding her bike without training wheels. It was the coolest thing ever. Outside of the Bible, there's, there's no perfect blueprint on what to teach when as it pertains to parenting. It's, it, it's kind of a fluid task and responsibility, isn't it? Right? There's, there's no clear blueprint on, well, when they're this old, we're supposed to teach them this, and then we're supposed to teach them that, and then we're supposed to work through this. Like, the, 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 I think God did that on purpose. Because he understood that as a heavenly father who wants to be in relationship with us, he understood that parenting isn't about necessarily having the right blueprint, but it's about engaging in a relationship, amen? It's about being intentional. It's about taking ownership of the task for which he's called us. Something that I've come to learn, though, is that what does matter is the effort that we put forth. Sometimes as a parent, you have to figure it out through sheer effort. You have to figure out what works for you. But the best part about that is that when you figure it out on your own, you take more ownership and your kids will notice that. Your kids notice you putting forth effort. David Dreary, uh, Joe and I are actually going through a book right now called Being Dad, okay? Pastor Joe's a new father and so he thought it would be really good to go through this book together. And uh, he, he had a whole chapter on the book of effort, just make an effort, making, making an effort as a parent. This is what he said. He said, the principle is one of effort. Kids want to know that dad is making an effort to be with them, to love them, and to be proud of them. Children can read a dad's effort long before they read words. Long before they read words. What kind of effort are you putting forth to teach your, God, your children God's ways and his word? So we have to model, we have to teach, we have to pay attention to those two things, but then finally, we, I think we'd be foolish not to think about and consider what we allow as parents, okay? What we allow. 
And here's the catch, okay? This is what many of you may not be considering. This includes allowing what we shouldn't be allowing. This includes what we shouldn't be allowing, excuse me, and, and what we should be allowing. This includes what we should not be allowing and what we should be allowing. Some of us are allowing our children to be exposed to so much more than they should ever be exposed to in their lives, let alone adulthood. I mean, can I just... I, most, there, there are so many parents that are exposing their children to things that they shouldn't be exposed to in their entire lives, let alone adulthood. This is a huge mistake. Once again, let me give a specific for a moment. I'm talking about unsupervised internet access. I'm talking about media and television like Game of Thrones and Deadpool. Social media with zero accountability. Underage drinking, so long as you're with us, right? As long as you're with us, you can go ahead. I, I love you all, but you are just making a mistake. You're making a mistake in what you're allowing. And, and, and you're not just making a mistake for yourself as a parent, but you're, you're impacting your child in ways you have no idea. You're hurting their future, future mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual stability over acts of the flesh that are obvious. The Bible says the acts of the flesh, the acts of sin of the sin nature are obvious, and you know it. You know it's wrong that you're exposing them to those things. You know it's wrong that you're exposing yourself to those things. If you wouldn't view it in church, why are you viewing it at home? If you wouldn't do it at church, why are you doing it at home? Are you living one life or two? Let's talk about what we're modeling. Let's talk about what we're allowing. I love you all. And I love your children. And I know I could never love your children as much as you do. But let me tell you, what you are allowing in some of our homes, you're making a mistake. And that mistake could impact eternity. Not only for yourself, but for your child as well. But here's the thing. Then there are those of us who aren't allowing things that maybe we should be. Those of us that have become helicopter parents who hover over every single thing their child experiences, says, and does. We're exasperating them and, and, and embittering them. We think we're protecting them when in reality we're destroying their ability to mature, learn, and grow on their own, as well as their credibility as they move into adulthood. But not only that, we are crippling them and holding them back from the adventure God set out before them. Let me just read this to you. Last month, Leslie Nelson touched on, the, on this in his message, and, and, and I, it inspired me to write this, and I just want to make sure you hear me loud and clear. So I'm not going to be able to give you eye contact, but I, I just want to get this right, what I wrote here. The Christian walk needs to be painted and modeled and taught and encouraged to be the adventure God created it to be. Do you hear me this morning? The Christian walk needs to be painted and modeled and taught and encouraged to be the adventure God created it to be. We can't just give our kids this hand-me-down faith that we've created and searched out on our own. We have to allow them to wrestle and to experience the inward illumination of Jesus Christ in their hearts on their own. How about this question? Are we allowing our kids to wrestle with their faith? Are we scowling at them and shaking our heads when they question or doubt? Are we giving them a safe place to talk about what their, what their faith, what God's leading them to, or what Satan's trying to discourage them from? When I was leading a youth group uh, back in 2010, or 2011, um, it was 2010, excuse me. Back in 2010 when I was leading a youth group, I used to tell my students, I, I look them straight in the eye and I say, don't believe everything your parents tell you. And some of you guys are going, what's wrong with you, Rob? 
But it wasn't about telling them to be disobedient, was it? It was about, hey, search out your beliefs on your own. Own your faith. If you really, I know, you're, I know your mom makes you come to youth group every Wednesday. I know you've been doing it since you were seven, but have you actually opened this book? Have you ever actually cracked this binder and figured it out for yourself? Have you ever actually come to the conclusion that, yeah, I actually do believe in Jesus Christ, that he died for my sins and was resurrected from the grave on the third day? I actually do believe in who he was and, and I try to follow everything that he tells me to do because if God can predict his own death and raise himself from the dead, then I should probably believe everything he says. What are you doing to allow your child to wrestle? Would they even feel safe coming to you with doubts or struggles about their faith? I think that's highly important. What are you modeling? What are you teaching? What are you allowing? Are you letting your kids r take a little risk for their faith? Are you letting them go on missions trips? Are you trying to support them in everything that they want to do, every endeavor they take on because they feel like God's called them to it? Even if it might mean a little bit of risk. What do you model, teach, and allow? So let's get some application here today, okay? So what, Rob, what are we supposed to do this? Where do we go from here? This isn't very specific. I, I feel like these are really general and I would just wanna get a little bit deeper. Here are some assignments for you this week. And I'm telling you the difference between those of us that are gonna, that, that are gonna grow and those of us that aren't are gonna be the ones that actually take the application part of the message each week and, and uh, apply it immediately, okay? So here's my assignment to those of you that are parents, and I know we have a lot of you that aren't parents yet, that's okay. These are things you need to go home and, and think about on your own. You need to journal about them. You need to talk to, to somebody else about it. Maybe you, maybe you do have a boyfriend or a girlfriend. These are good things to talk about. Hey, if we ever get married someday, what are some things that we wanna do? What are some things we wanna model? What are some things we wanna teach? What do we wanna allow? So here are my questions to you, and they're in, the, in your outline, but I want you to go home, and I want you to sit at the table. My wife and I are gonna do this this week. I, I plan to do it with her. We're going to take an inventory of what we model, te uh, model positive and negatively. Okay, what are some things that we know we hate and, you know, because we model bad things to our kids, right? We all do. You know, for me, it's probably my, my, my temper every now and then, right? So what am I modeling negatively that I want to have God remove and that we want to work on? What are some positive things that we want to make sure are passed on to them? What are some things that I'm not modeling that I need to start so they get it, Right? Just take an inventory, right? Get a, get a notebook and a pen and start writing these things down. What, what are some things that we model that are positive and negative that we don't like, that we know we're passing on to our kids that like, man, I'm already seeing this and, and my oldest boy and I don't, want, I don't want him to have that later in life. How can I work on that with him? How can I begin to model that better? Secondly, create a list of attributes you'd like to teach your child. Use the Bible as a starting point or guideline. Because that way you can use the Bible to teach them, right? Our job as parents isn't just to get them to know all the knowledge of God's word. Our job is to teach them where faith and life intersect, amen? amen. We need to, them to know that church isn't separate from our lives. It's, it's who we are. Jesus is who we are. And, and, and God has wisdom that he wants to give us that we might succeed in this life. And not only that, be fruitful, in this life. So we need to create a list of attributes that you'd like to teach a child. Use the Bible as a starting point. Just walk through the Gospels and see what attributes or teachings you see in Jesus that you'd like to, your children to take on. Hopefully it's all of them. But start by going through Bible stories each night with them. You don't have to know everything. You just have to be willing to put forth what? Effort. Put forth some effort and follow and learn about Jesus alongside of them. Because I tell you what, when you're making a disciple, you learn and grow too, don't you? It's just like when you teach something, you learn so much more than if you just sit in a classroom. Discipleship is less about ability and more about availability. Write that down. Discipleship is less about ability and more about availability. What are you doing to step into discipleship with your child? Where are you making an effort? And then the last two questions you should ask yourself are, what are we allowing that we shouldn't be? Let's wrestle with that together. What aren't we allowing that maybe we should be? 
that maybe we should consider. I had a pastor friend of mine tell me a story about um, a mother who came up to him at the end of a service one Sunday, and they were getting ready to go on this missions trip, and she said, my daughter will not be going on that missions trip. She looked him straight in the eyes. My daughter will not be going on that missions trip, so don't you dare encourage her to go, and don't you tell her father about it either. What is that mother not allowing that maybe she should be? Some resources, because I'm not an expert on, a parent, on parenting, um, that I thought have just been absolutely fantastic. A uh, book called it's, not, it's Just a Face, So Don't Miss It by Reggie Joyner. Uh, Reggie Joyner does a great job at talking about helping um, parents and kids' ministries uh, learn how to disciple children and, and, uh, and how faith and life intersect. He's got another book called Parenting Beyond Your Capacity. It's a phenomenal book. Um, and then for those of you parents that have children that are wrestling, right, that maybe have come to you and said, I'm not sure about my faith, I'm not sure about Jesus, I'm not sure about church, all of those things. Uh, Reverend Tim Purcell, my boss, our district superintendent, actually told me about a couple of books that I really, really enjoy. Uh, I've been looking through and, and skimming through right now, but he's gone through these with his boys when they were wrestling with their faith. It's, they're, they're both uh, books by a guy named Paul E. Little, okay, and it's Know What You Believe and Know Why You Believe. And he just walked through these with his teen boys and helped them learn and grow and figure out, hey, this is what we believe and this is why we believe it. And he allowed them to wrestle. And it was a really, really healthy exercise for them. So if you're looking for something that's a little bit more specific on the Christian faith and why we believe what we believe, et cetera, these are a couple of great resources. And then finally, this is my most favorite resource that I'm gonna give you this morning. If you don't buy any of the books, if you don't read any of the material I give you, just take an hour, sit down with your spouse, or if you don't have a spouse, it's fine. Sit down and watch this video, okay? I'm telling you, I'm telling you, I'm telling you, you will not regret it. It is the best parenting resource I've ever come across. It's called Future Family. It's by my favorite pastor, Andy Stanley. Him and his wife sit down and just talk about the struggles of parenting and what they've done to try and, and, and tackle this thing the best way that they can. I mean, I can, I'm telling you, I cannot, I cannot champion this video enough, okay? So uh, uh, take some time, set it aside. It's about an hour long. Uh, just an awesome video on parenting and take lots of notes, okay? I want to finish by saying this, and the worship team can come forward, or Justin can come, for, come forward at this time. Going back to Reggie Joyner, um, in the book, uh, Parenting Beyond Your Capacity, um, he talks about how crucial it is for kids to, to encounter the mission of God early. Otherwise, they adopt a warped view of the gospel or are discouraged from their faith altogether, okay? And in his book, he tells the story of a dad concerned as his daughter uh, is cooled toward her faith in her early teen years. She began to date a boy uh, that the dad described as bad news. How many parents have been there? Um, she started to dress goth and uh, show a general disdain for the church. He confided to a pastor and he said, I just don't know what I'm doing wrong. We've always been faithful at church, making it a priority. We've had her memorize the scripture verses. We've sent her on youth activities. The pastor replied, what ministries are your family involved in? The father couldn't name one. That might be your problem, said the pastor. The world's offering your daughter a more compelling story than you are. In the world, she sees adventure and purpose. Here at the church, you've treated her as though she's simply a receptacle for information. He goes on, he says, when there's nothing challenging or adventurous about your style of faith, you begin to drift toward other things that seem more interesting and meaningful. Mission helps your faith. Mission helps your faith. When God designed kids to be arrows, and instead we treat them like pieces of art to decorate our, our home, we are not only stunting their development, but discouraging them from faith altogether. Let me tell you, Stephanie and I's number one goal, we don't want our kids to be PKs. We don't want them to be typical PKs. We want them to fall in love with Jesus, and we want them to fall in love with the church, and we want to have them step into the mission that we're trying to accomplish just as much as everyone else. Our mission to connect people to God. Jesus died for that mission. And this morning we're gonna um, partake of the elements. Um, 
But before we do, I, I want us to bow our heads and just take a moment and take an inventory. I know not everybody in here is a parent. I know many of us may, maybe even have had the blessing of that experience, but um, I don't think it would be foolish for us to sit here and go, what am I allowing in my own life? What am I modeling in my own life to others? What am I teaching in my own life to others?